Thank you. My name is Cora Cisneros Malloy. I have been employed with Morgan and Morgan since 2014. Before that, I worked for industry, and so I know a little bit about both sides of the fence, which is extremely important. I'm also bilingual, so I represent a lot of injured workers that speak only Spanish, um, and so that's a great advantage to our Spanish-speaking clients. Uh, prior to that, I lived in Miami, where Richard's office is, and I um, did uh, civil work, and I also did criminal work working under Janet Reno and also Bob Butterworth, the statewide prosecutor. Uh, but now I work for the people and I love what I do. We help people every day. Hi, Rich Robbins, I'm down in the Miami office, workers' compensation attorney, been with Morgan & Morgan since 2018. Before that, I also uh, represented employers and insurance companies. So I have the, the same unique perspective that Cora has to see both sides of the aisle. Um, represent the people now. It's the best job I've ever had. It's way more fulfilling than representing the employers and the insurance companies, in my opinion. Um, I handle all cases in the Dade County and Monroe County areas, and uh, I'm happy to be here today and happy to answer questions. Okay, we're going to start with our first question uh, from Dale in Tampa, Florida. Pat, Dale's question is, is there a time frame in which I have to pursue my claim for workers' compensation? We'll start with Cora. Yes, there is. Uh, there's a 30 day limitation period from the time that you are injured, but there are lots of exceptions. Uh, in workers' compensation, there are rules and then there are exceptions to those rules. So let's say that you have an injury, but you don't even know that it's work related because it might be due to repetitive trauma or some other type of injury that may not manifest itself in one minute or one particular point in time. Uh, the law says that as long as you report it within 30 days of the day that you first knew of the problem and knew that it was work-related, hint, hint, that means that a doctor said it was related, um, then you're okay. So it's a 30-day limitation, but frankly, you really need to report all work accidents to the employer and request medical care and attention at the very, very first opportunity that you have after you have sustained a work accident. Thank you, Cora. The only thing I would add to that, if, if I might, is just in writing is always better for us too. send a text, send an email. That way you're not coming down to a he said, she yeah. said when they say that they don't know anything about it. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Um, our second question is from Marina in Fort Myers. Marina's question is, am I required to return to work after an accident if I'm still in pain? So that's not that, that's a simple answer and not a simple answer. The, the answer obviously is nobody can force you to do anything. So you don't have to return to work, but the consequence is you don't get paid. If the doctor, and, and there's, there's different levels to that. If you are injured at work and the doctor has you on light duty work restrictions and they don't have a light duty job for you, then you obviously don't have to go back to work. If they try to offer you a light duty job and you don't accept that light duty job, then they're going to say that you're limiting your income, you know, essentially meaning that now your refusal to go to work is the reason why you're losing money and not the work accident. So the trade-off is if, if they have light duty available for you, you should try it and if, you know, so that you can continue to get paid and keep your job. If you don't take it, they're not going to pay you. Workers' compensation is not going to pay you and you're, you know, you'll be sitting at home injured and then also have the negative of not getting paid. Okay, we're going to move on to the next question. This question is from Aubrey in Miami. Aubrey's question is, do I have the right to go to my own doctors if I don't like the doctor that the workers' compensation insurance company has provided? And a second question to follow up is, can I use my own health insurance and get a second opinion from my own doctors? Absolutely no. Do not use your health insurance. Do not use your private money workers' compensation owes medical benefits. They get to pick the doctors simply because the doctors that treat injured employees have to sign a contract, just like in our own Cigna insurance or Medicare insurance or any type of insurance. The doctors that agree to accept those patients have to have a contract with the provider so that they are paid at that, at that particular level. 
in workers' compensation, unfortunately, injured employees do not have an opportunity to select their doctors. It is the exclusive right of the employer carrier. We can select our experts, but that's completely different. That's when you're litigating a case. But in terms of treatment, the employer carrier have that exclusive right. And if you go outside of the system, that particular treatment or those particular recommendations do not have to be heeded by the, the carrier or the employer. Anything to add, Richard? No, I think you covered it. Oh, I'm sorry. The next question we have is from Rosa. And Rosa's question is, can I sue my employer for negligence that resulted in a workplace injury? No, you cannot. Uh, employers have what's known as workers' compensation immunity. Uh, they are immune from being sued for negligence. Um, a lot of people have a hard time with that because if something that their employer did resulted in their injury, you know, they don't understand how they can't sue. Uh, but the, the, the simple fact is you don't need to show negligence to pursue a workers' compensation claim. It's a no false system. Even if there was no negligence, you're still covered by workers' compensation. But you, you, you know, they do have a need from being sued in civil court for a negligence claim. Okay, thank you, Richard. Thank you. The next question we have is from Jeffrey, and Jeffrey wants to know: I am an un, I am an undocumented worker, and I don't have a valid social security number. So Jeffrey's question is: Do I still have the right to receive workers' compensation benefits if I'm injured at work? And then a follow-up is, what if I use a false name or an invalid social security number when I apply for the job? Am I still eligible for workers' compensation? I'll take that. I have a lot of clients that fall into that category. And a lot of times individuals uh, come to our country and they're undocumented workers. They are still offered employment and they do um, at times use invalid documentation in order to obtain employment or to get hired. However, once you're injured, then you must, once you're injured, you must uh, use only valid information. If at the time of hire, you used a name that wasn't yours, you used a social security number that's not assigned to you, never, ever, ever use that information for any purpose, whether it be at the emergency room, at the clinic, with anyone that calls you from the insurance carrier. At no point in time do you provide any information that is false and incorrect and invalid. You're injured, you, everybody knows you were working, you're getting paid by that employer, they know that you got injured on the job, you do have the right to receive workers' compensation benefits, but if you use any any invalid or fraudulent information, you are going to lose those rights. It's a forfeiture of your rights if you provide any false or misleading uh, information to the employer, their carrier, doctors, or any of their agents. Thank you, Cora. Our next question is from Francis, and Francis would like to know, the workers' compensation doctor told me that I can go back to light duty work but I don't feel well enough to get back to work and the medications I've been prescribed do not permit me to drive or work safely. Am I allowed to stay home until I feel better and well enough to work? So this is a, another layer to the question that was asked earlier with, can I, do I have to go back to work? And essentially this one comes down to what is the authorized doctor saying? You know, we have to look at those restrictions closely. Uh, does the doctor, say make you feel you know that like you're it's unsafe to drive um, the the employer is only going to go based off of what that authorized doctor's opinions are with restrictions so one thing you can do go back to the doctor tell him how you're feeling these medications make me feel drowsy or you know, the, whatever the symptom is, uh, is it safe for me to drive 30 miles in downtown traffic 
to work. And he might say, no, I'm going to limit your driving, at which point you wouldn't have to go back to work. But if there's no limitation on your ability to drive and you know the, the doctor has you on light duty and your employer has a light duty job, then they are going to require that you go back to work or, like I said earlier, you'll forfeit that opportunity to, uh, to receive income, whether it be from your employer or from workers' compensation. Thanks, Richard. Here's a question that we get a lot, and I think a lot of people are concerned about this. The question is from Marcelo. He wants to know, I hurt myself while working. I'm afraid to tell my supervisor because I'm fear that he, it might be grounds for him to fire me. What should I do? If an employer terminates an employee simply because they were hurt on the job or simply because they have a worker's compensation claim pending, that is a separate and distinct cause of action. It is not proper. It is against Florida statutes for an employer to take any adverse employment action against an employee simply because they were hurt on the job or they retained an attorney or that they have a, a pending workers' compensation case. It is retaliatory workers' compensation discrimination, and we have expert attorneys that will be able to assist you in that arena. Um, the jurisdiction or the power of the court is actually in state court. It's not even something that is handled by the judge of compensation claims, and it could be done in conjunction with your workers' compensation case. So at that point, if you're wrongfully terminated, you'd have two wonderful Morgan & Morgan attorneys representing you. Great. Thank you, Cora. Uh, here's another question that comes up often. It's related to multiple injuries. And the question is from Jacob. Should I tell the doctor about a prior motor vehicle accident, even though it was a long time ago, and my pain is different or worse now? Yes, you should tell the doctor everything. Disclose, err on the side of disclosure. Uh, you know, most of the time it doesn't make a difference. You know, if, if you had a motor vehicle accident from 10 years ago, five years ago, and you had whiplash and you had treated with a chiropractor for your neck, and now you, know, you went back to work and worked for five or 10 years, and now you have this work accident that results in a neck injury, nothing's gonna change. The doctor's gonna say that your neck problems are because of the work accident. But if you don't disclose the prior history, if you don't tell the doctor about the prior motor vehicle accident, the insurance company will eventually find it. They find every piece of information on you. They have ways of doing it. They And they will find out that you had a neck injury before and they will deny your case for fraud, for misrepresentation and say that you purposefully withheld that information from the doctor because in your mind, you thought if you told the doctor that you aren't gonna get workers' compensation benefits. And then it's a get out of jail free card for them. No matter how legitimate your accident is, no matter how hurt you are, if they find that piece of information from your past and use it against you, you can end up with, with no benefits, no medical treatment, no lost wages, nothing. So always, always, always err on the side of disclosure. Okay, thank you, Richard. And here's another question. It's more related to the accident itself and lead up to the accident. And Heather is asking, should I take a drug test following an accident if I know the results will likely be positive? Absolutely. If it's a drug-free workplace, you need to take that drug test. Even if it's not a drug-free workplace, you need to take that drug test because if you don't take the test, there's not much we can do for you, right? You failed. You failed to, you, you refused to take the test. However, if you took the test, even if it's positive, there's lots of things that um, can be argued. And if you are prescribed that medication by a doctor, that's a negative test. So it wouldn't be a positive if you are taking medication, for instance, for a legitimate medical condition and you have been prescribed medications by your doctor and you are able to establish that, the, uh, the individual that interpret the results will take that into consideration. And so that positive might be a negative for purposes of that particular work accident. In addition, if there's a presumption in the law that says, well, if you're under the influence of drugs or alcohol, clearly your accident must have happened because of your lack of judgment. Well, what if a, you know, a, a steel post lands on your head and you're looking in one direction and it's behind you and you can't even see it. 
There is no way that I don't care what level of inebriation you were in, that that's going to be something that is going to be counted against you. So there's lots of different exceptions to that rule. The only thing that you can do to protect yourself is if they're offering you a drug test, you have to take it because if not, then you will not be entitled to any benefits. Anything else you have to say about that, Richard? I know you encountered that frequently. That's Oh yeah, definitely. I would, I would much rather have you fail a drug test than not take a drug test. Mm -hmm. so, Plus it's always. also very difficult for them to prove it, right? It's very, the, the standards for being, for them being able to give, introduce that evidence has, um, I mean, it's pages and pages <laughs> of legal legality. Yeah. So. They got to show chain of custody and how it was collected and size of the vial and temperature of the sample. And if there's so much they got to do, the, the, the nanograms of the level of substance in your system and what, you know, so there's, there's a million ways we can attack a positive drug test, but there's very, very little, if anything, we can do for a refusal. Nothing we can do for a refusal. Okay, thank you. Here's a question that we get a lot as well, and it pertains to the accident and the location of the accident. And the question is from Taylor, Am I covered by workers' comp if I'm driving to work or home from work, so not in the workplace itself? So this is one of those no but questions, right? So Cora said earlier that there's always exceptions. No, there's something called the going and coming rule. If you're going to work or coming home from work, you are not covered under workers' compensation. But there's always exceptions to the rule. Depends on what you're doing, depends on the job. The boss could have called you and said, can you stop at uh, you know, the store and pick up paper or toner for the copier on your way in and you, you're running an errand for them, but you're still on your way to work, you might be covered. Um, if they're sending you between job sites or there's always exceptions to the rule. If you're strictly just you know, going and coming from work, probably not covered, but you know, the facts are very, it's a very fact specific area that, that you know, you're going to want to consult an attorney on to make sure that, you, that you, even if they tell you you're not covered, you may end up being covered. Thanks, Richard. Um, here's another question that comes up a lot as well. It's from Tiara, and Tiara wants to know, if the employer tells me I'm an independent contractor and not a full-time employee, does that mean I'm automatically not covered by workers' compensation? Absolutely not. Um, I've had several of these cases just recently, and in every single instance, the classification that was um, placed on the client by the employer um, was attacked, successfully attacked. Um, just because you call someone an independent contractor does not make them an independent contractor. Even if you have a written independent contractor agreement that you've signed, and they're treating you with the control as an employee, we can attack it and advise them that they have misclassified you, they have paid you improperly as an independent contractor, and that we are able to then obtain workers' compensation benefits on your behalf. Thank you, Cora. Um, here's another question from Ian. And Ian wants to know, if my employer does not have workers' compensation coverage, do I have, do I have any options for receiving workers' compensation benefits? You do have options. Um, it depends on what you're doing. A lot of the easiest uh, industry to to look to is the construction industry. So if you're working for a company that doesn't have workers' compensation coverage, there's something called a statutory employer. Essentially, you could start climbing the ladder to find workers' compensation coverage. So you would go to the company that hired your company. And if they don't have workers' compensation coverage, you continue to go up the ladder until presumably you get to the general contractor who would have workers' compensation coverage. So if your employer was hired to do a job by another company and your employer doesn't have workers' compensation coverage, we may be able to find workers' compensation coverage through that other company. Um, the other thing I would say is if, if they don't have workers' compensation coverage, but they have general liability coverage, and then you, that may be a situation where you could then pursue a claim against them in, in circuit court. I miss anything on that, Cora? Just the election of remedy. So if, if they don't have any coverage and if you can prove negligence, and that's, that's the big deciding point there. Um, many times 
you can't prove negligence. That's why they develop workers' compensation laws so that it's a no-fault law that provides coverage to everyone, no matter what. An injured employee could be 100% responsible. An employer could be 100% responsible. Each employee gets the same exact benefits. Um, so it's not a matter of proving a fault. It's a no-fault system. However, if they don't have the workers' compensation coverage, then you, as the injured person, can elect the remedy, and then you can go to circuit civil court and improve that negligence, which has a lot better damages than work comp. Thank you. And here's a question that I think is relevant to a lot of people. The question is from Annie in Tallahassee. Annie wants to know, when I was hurt, I had two different employers. So what happens now that I'm injured and I'm not able to work at either of those two jobs? So this one is interesting because there's something called concurrent employment, which is essentially uh, two jobs. It affects the amount of money that you may be due from workers' compensation. So if you get hurt at job A and you're not able to do either job, right, then that affects how much money you're going to receive from workers' compensation. If they calculate how much you're entitled to and you would lump all those wages together from before the accident to come up with an average weekly wage, right? And then moving forward as the doctor has you out of work, if you're missing both jobs, that's gonna affect the size or the amount of money that you get from workers' compensation, right? Because they have an offset on actual earnings after the accident. So if you're able to do one job, but not the other, you might get some money from workers compensation, but not as much because they're going to offset those earnings. But if you're not able to do either job, then the amount that you're going to receive from workers compensation is going to go up because you're losing income from both jobs. Okay, thank you. Here's another question that relates to current events somewhat related to COVID. The question is from Jennifer and she wants to know, she was, Jennifer was an essential worker during COVID. She caught COVID during Jan, in January, um, but she's still suffering side effects. She wants to know, do I have a case? It depends on whether or not she is engaged in a profession that is subject to acquiring that disease more than the general public. So normal, uh, diseases of life, meaning any one of us could get COVID, whether we're on the job, off the job, um, and there's very, it's very, very difficult to prove where we became contaminated, unless, of course, we are a nurse, a CNA, uh, another type of medical professional, individuals that work in hospitals, in nursing homes, assisted living facilities, law enforcement officers, EMTs, Individuals that are subjected to a lot more of the disease in environments where the disease is prevalent would be able to prove up a case for COVID exposure on the job. But if you don't have that special status or that exposure to a special hazard by the nature of what you do for a living, then it's very, very difficult to establish a case. Thank you, Cora. And here's another question that we get a lot as well when it comes to light duty and light duty responsibilities. The question's from Joy and she wants to know, my employer contacted me to let me know that they have a light duty job available, but I know they don't have any light duty at my workplace. Am I still obligated to return to work? So you should go, you should go see what it is that they're offering you, right? Let's say that the doctor has you on restrictions of no lifting more than 15 pounds and uh, you know, sitting 15 minutes every hour, and you go in to the job, and they want you to, you know, let, let's say you're a, a cashier at Publix, and you they you go in, and they offer you a stool to sit on, so you can sit and stand as needed, but the groceries that are coming through the line, you get a 50-pound bag of dog food, right? That would exceed your restrictions, so it wouldn't be a job within your restrictions. I would notify a supervisor, listen, this is outside of my restrictions that the doctor has me on, I can't do it, and see what their response is. If they say, you have to, you have no choice, that's the job, then you can politely decline and, and not take the light duty job and then see how it shakes out. They might try to deny your work, you know, your, your lost wages, but that's something we could easily fight. 
but if they might say, okay, let me get a helper over here and they'll t lift anything that's over 15 pounds for you so that you can continue the job within your restrictions. You know, when, when you're on light duty, they don't even have to give you a real job. They could put you in the office and have you watch paint dry. So if they say they have a light duty job for you, I would, I would try. I would I'd go down there and see what they're talking about before you just throw your hands up and say, they, they don't, I know that place. Thanks, Richard. Here's a question from Donna in Jacksonville. Donna's husband unfortunately suffered a tragic accident at work. He was crushed by a bulldozer on a, on a, on a union job site. And Donna's question is, should all of his benefits be doubled, including an annuity? And is there a way to make workers' compensation pay a lump sum payment, or do I have to keep waiting for the monthly payment? In terms of death benefits in the state of Florida, um, you do have an opportunity to try to get the uh, the death benefits resolved by way of settlement. Settlements and workers' compensation are 100% voluntary. So if the employer carrier are not interested in settling the case or if the injured employees, uh, dependents, uh, individuals that are receiving those death benefits are not interested, no one can force anyone to settle a case. But if the uh, individual, the spouse or the dependent children are wishing to get their future payments accelerated, meaning paid up front, you're not going to get the total amount of that future income flow because of what? The time value of money. Money that you get today is worth a lot more money than money that you are promised years and years in the, in the, in the future. So what they do is they, they settle it out. They settle it for a discounted amount to make up for that time value of money, that you're getting money now that is not due today, but they're accelerating the payment. So the insurance carrier does get a discount for that. Well, thank you, Cora. This is another question that is very common. We get very often, it's a question from Chloe in Orlando. Chloe, she writes, I feel like I was cheated or didn't get the best possible results for my workers' compensation case, which has now been closed. So Chloe's question is, can the case be reopened or can be opened by somebody who might fight harder or fight better on my behalf? Unfortunately, no. Once that case is closed, once the, the judge approves a settlement, uh, it, there, we can't reopen it. There's nothing that we can do. Um, what I would say or what I would suggest is before you make that decision, that ultimate decision, think about it, right? Before, if, you're, if you're unrepresented by an attorney, you have to go in front of the judge for a hearing for him to approve your settlement, him or her, sorry, uh, to approve your settlement to say whether or not this is in your best interest. But if you have an attorney and you don't think that attorney is doing good by you or right by you, you don't have to agree to a settlement because as soon as you say, yes, I'm good with that number, that's it. Okay, it's, it's, it's pretty much a done deal and they can enforce the settlement, close your case, and it's that's forever closed. So if you if you have an attorney that you don't think is is operating in your best interest, you don't have to stay with that attorney. You can seek outside counsel. Thank you, Richard. This is a question from Bailey in Tampa. It's a question related to the actual claim itself. And the question is, can an employer say medical only on your claim and not offer to pay for other services? or offer any other kind of assistance with your recovery? It's an interesting question because when they say that the employer says it's medical only, um, it's not really up to the employer, it's up to the doctor. So medical only means that there has been no lost time. That means that the injured employee is not being restricted from work or is being offered work and has not sustained any uh, lost time from work or any lost wages. And that's a determination that will be up to the doctors to determine number one, what are the restrictions, if any? And then number two, whether the employer is going to offer that injured employee a job within those restrictions. And again, you know, we have to be reasonable about this. If the doctor says no lifting greater than 10 pounds, you have to do a sedentary job, which means sit down duty, and you go to the workplace and they say, here, Here's a mop, here's a broom. I want you to clean up the entire shop and all the bathrooms. Well, that's not within the doctor's restriction. And you can politely say, no, that's not within my restrictions. And I'm sorry, I can't do that type of work. Um, and then you can 
not perform that work. Typically when that happens, the employer may send you home because they can't accommodate your restrictions. Um, but if the medical doctors that are authorized to treat you do not indicate that you have any restrictions and that you can go back to regular duty work, um, that that might truly be a medical only case because the doctors have not restricted your work duties or restricted what you can do when you go back to the workplace. Thank you, Cora. And this is an interesting question. Most workers' compensation claims have a specific date when the incident happened, the injury or whatever the incident might have been. And Jamie from Miami has a question. What about an accident or an injury that was took place over time? Um, specifically in Jamie's case, there was exposure to arsenic over a long period of time. So there isn't a specific date when the incident happens. Uh, how do I go about getting a claim started? So two kind of parts to that. The overtime thing would be known as a repetitive trauma claim. So uh, a data entry person, someone who's typing all day, develops carpal tunnel syndrome over years of, uh, of you know, doing that job could be an accident, right? It could, could end up being a compensable uh, injury that workers' compensation would have to pay for under a repetitive trauma theory. Uh, those are more difficult to prove, but definitely not impossible. Uh, it depends a lot on the doctors. It depends on the, you know, the job duties. And, and, and so those cases are certainly cases that we can pursue. But the second the part of that case, or the second part of that question being, the exposure to arsenic. So now you're getting into more of an exposure theory, occupational disease type theory, which makes it significantly harder, not impossible, but significantly harder. Um, just standard exposure cases, like there's mold in my building, nearly if not impossible to prove under the current statute in Florida. Uh, but occupational disease, Things like uh, hearing loss, exposure to certain chemicals can be a, a, a compensable workers' compensation case, but they are very fact specific as well. You know, one of the things like ex exposure to uh, you, sometimes you get chemical burns, you were exposed to a chemical. That now you, you have a physical injury to go along with some of these more uh, these symptoms that that they would classify as more uh, flu-like or. Or, or just standard, you know, something like uh, shortness of breath, right? People have shortness of breath. How do you relate that to exposure at work? It becomes extremely difficult and, you know, very, very fact specific. Um, generally speaking, those cases are not very winnable cases. You know, if you're, if you have lead poisoning and you work in an ammunition factory, that might be a little bit easier to, to, you know, to tie to your employer. But it's, it's, it's going to come down to who your employer is, what the situation is, but they're, they're, they're difficult. They're difficult, not impossible. Cora, what do you think? They're extremely difficult. And, and the, the, the problem with occupational exposure cases is that the standard in the law is higher. So what we have to prove as attorneys in those cases is different than what we have to prove in a case involving a one-time event, a physical injury, an actual one-time accident. So for those occupational disease cases, we have to bring in medical evidence establishing that what our clients are suffering from is something caused by that environment and that there is sufficient exposure to, the, to, to whatever it is that is causing them the medical issues, that there has been sufficient duration for them to develop that disease. And so it becomes extremely difficult to prove simply because it has to be based upon epidemiological studies and has to be based upon medical evidence saying that that particular exposure to that particular individual is what is causing their medical condition to arise. Thank you, Cora and Richard. And here's a kind of a question that's also related to something Richard mentioned about carpal tunnel the question is from Chelsea and she wants to know, my grandmother is having problems with her hand because she works at Sam's scanning tickets. She's been going back and forth to the doctor getting shots and possibly might have to have surgery. Her question is, does she have a case to receive workers' compensation? 
She may. Again, it's, it, that's a repetitive trauma theory case, meaning that it wasn't a one-time event that caused her symptoms. As long as her doctor is saying, hey, you know what, what do you do for a living? Perhaps that particular condition is related to the repetitive nature of your work activities. But what if your grandmother also is a knitter or plays the piano or has other hobbies or perhaps has other comorbidities or a lot of different reasons why individuals develop carpal tunnel and they aren't always, always related to their work exposure. So again, it is a situation that has to be proven by medical testimony where you have a doctor saying, yes, that particular work that you were doing while you were at Sam's Club caused this condition. And it's the major condition. It is the primary condition because you could have all sorts of other things at play. And, you know, even just being a woman and maybe being a little overweight, being pregnant, or even genetics comes into play when it comes to some of those conditions such as carpal tunnel. So it's always down to the medicine. Everything in work comp is pretty much based upon what the doctors say, the medical testimony, and what the doctors are going, how they're going to analyze that particular um, situation and if they're gonna be able to tie it together, tie in the medical condition with the work activity. Thank you, Cora and Richard. Um, here's a question, it also comes in very often. The question is, I've been fighting for almost a year with workers' compensation to get the medical care I need. If it's ruled in my favor, will they have to pay me back wages and the medical bills for my treatment? Easier to get an answer quicker. Um, but potentially, yes, it depends on if they end up being wrong. If, if you're saying, hey, I was injured at work, this is what's going on. I can't work, I'm under restrictions or the doctors have me out of work completely. Sorry, Richard, I'm gonna step in. I, it looks like your internet's a little choppy. Um, Cora, do you wanna just uh, uh, summarize what Richard said? Yes, or, sure, or sure. Um, yeah, yeah, there, um, in a lot of cases, the insurance carrier denies the case. They say, no, we're not gonna pay you any benefits. Well, you don't have to well, take you it. You come to Morgan and, Morgan, to Morgan and Morgan and we'll file a claim, a petition for benefits on your behalf. And at that point, since the claim has been denied, you can then utilize your private health insurance to obtain what we call self-help, meaning that now you're treating, you're not treating through work comp. And if they lose at trial, then they're going to have to go back and either reimburse the doctors and excuse me, reimburse health insurance and pay the difference, or they have to, there will be a, a health care lien. So they will be responsible for the back. The only problem there might be that if we do win, they may have the opportunity to change up all your doctors. Um, so during that period of time when you are arguing and you are in litigation to try to get the judge to enter an order forcing them to provide you benefits, you can go out and get yourself help. But it's risky because if the judge rules against us, then you're not going to get any reimbursement. Thank you, Cora. Um, the next question we have is from John in Tampa. And John wants to know, my boss paid for my hospital bill and has been paying me while I've been un unable to work. The doctors say that I need surgery, but my boss doesn't want to pay for it. Can I, make, can I file a claim against the insurance company now, even though my employer didn't report the accident to the insurance company? Uh, okay, so yes, you can. The, there's case law, uh, knowledge to the employer equals knowledge to the carrier. So if your employer knows about it, it doesn't matter that he didn't tell the insurance company. Uh, so that, that satisfies that 30-day reporting requirement that Cora talked about earlier. Um, as long as you pursue a claim within two years of the date of the accident, then you're not you know, barred by the statute of limitations. You're, you know, if your employer's trying to do the right thing or trying to you know, pay out of pocket, doesn't want to report it, trying to keep you on the payroll, and it ends up getting more than he can handle, you can definitely pursue those benefits with workers' compensation. 
Thank you, Richard. Uh, the next question we have is from Brian in Miami. And Brian wants to know, if I'm unable to return to my prior job because of the work injury, am I entitled to permanent disability benefits? Unfortunately, usually no. The standard is not whether you're able to go back and be a construction worker, a roofer, uh, a maintenance worker, a lawn maintenance worker. The standard in Florida is physically incapable of doing a sit down job part time. It has no bearing upon how much money you're going to be making at that sit down part time job. Um, and in Florida, it's very, very difficult to be able to be entitled to medical permanent total. That means the doctors are saying, not only can you not do that job, you can't do anything. You can't do even a sit down part time job. That rarely happens. The more likely scenario is that we would be able to establish permanent total disability vocationally, which means that based upon your education, your skill level, what you have done in the past, what your current permanent work restrictions are, you go out and you apply for 100 jobs, 200 jobs, you make getting a job your job and no one hires you. Or if you are hired, you're not able to actually perform sustained employment. Then you can prove because of that exhaustive, unsuccessful job search, together with the testimony of an expert vocational uh, individual that would come to hire someone to say, a person at this level, with this education, with these permanent restrictions is not going to be able to find a job or sufficient jobs within this particular labor market within a 50 mile radius of their home. Um, so it can be proven, it's difficult, but depending upon the circumstances, absolutely well worth it and something that we could, we could help you with and assist you in determining whether or not you are truly unemployable or if you should be able to return to some type of work. In Florida, there's also retraining. However, how can you be retrained if you don't even have a high school diploma? So that's where the education piece comes in, that if you're a non-English speaking or if you don't have a solid educational basis, you can't be retrained to do a less strenuous or less physical job simply because you don't have the background and the educational um, uh, credentials in order to be retrained. Thank you, Cora. Um, the next question is coming from Caitlin, <clears throat> excuse me, Caitlin in Fort Lauderdale. And Caitlin's question is, do I have to let a nurse case manager attend my appointments together with the workers' comp doctors? Right, so sometimes a nurse case manager is someone that the insurance company will assign to your file to help facilitate medical care. Their role is supposed to be helping you. It doesn't always work out that mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to go there and try to get the records, try to get the authorization for the MRI done faster, try to get your medications. But sometimes you run into these nurse case managers that are really just advocating for the insurance company and they're talking to the doctors, hey, release them to full duty, you know, it's been long enough. So it, it becomes a little contentious with the injured worker and the nurse case manager. They can go to the appointment, but they do not have to go into the exam room with you while you're being examined by the doctor. That's your time with the doctor. So you just tell them, I don't want you to go back there. You know, I, this is, I'm not allowing you to, to go into the exam room with the doctor. You're not gonna prevent them from communicating with the doctor, but you're going to at least have that opportunity to be one on one with that doctor patient relationship and let them know what you're feeling and what your symptoms are without this other third party in the room trying to influence and coerce the doctor into saying something or doing something that that you know, is not in your best interest. I always tell my clients a nurse case manager is not your friend. Why? What is their job? What is their mission? Their mission is to do what? cut claims costs, reduce the cost of your case, which necessarily means that they're gonna to try to dissuade the doctor from recommending things that are expensive or things that are costly because that's their job. Their job is to reduce claims costs. Not that that's a horrible thing. I understand that industry must be able to be profitable and make money. However, not on the backs of my clients or our clients when they're injured on the job. And so the time that you have with your doctors is limited enough 
don't let someone in there. You don't have to consent. I always object to a nurse case manager being present in an examination room together with the doctor and the doctor's physician's assistant. Thanks, Cora. Uh, this is the last of our pre-submitted questions, and then we'll get to some live questions. This question is from Madeline in Tampa. Madeline uh, suffered a bad injury at work. She wants to know, can I go to the emergency room if I'm in severe pain? That's a maybe. Um, the maybe is this, that it has to be a true medical emergency. So I tell my clients, can you walk? Can you go to the bathroom by yourself? Are you in such excruciating pain that it truly is a medical emergency? If you have an authorized doctor, contact the doctor's office, contact the clinic, let them know what's going on and let them instruct you as to what to do. Some of the times they'll actually tell you, go directly to the emergency room if your symptoms are severe enough but you have to prove an emergency for the worker's compensation carrier to be responsible for the payment of that emergency department bill. And those are hefty bills. So if the carrier denies it, and if it comes out that it wasn't a true emergency, then you could get stuck with those bills. So it's just extremely important in this particular system, since the doctors are authorized, you're gonna have a primary care physician, you're gonna have doctors or specialists, if you are referred to a specialist, contact those doctors first. So what if it happens on a weekend? If it happens on a weekend, then obviously you're not going to be able to contact the doctor's office, but they always have a 24-7 um, line that you can contact, right? So when you call, the answering service will answer and they'll say, is this an emergency? And you say, yes, it's an emergency. And the likelihood is that they will send you to the emergency department, but you have to be extremely careful because we, we have to prove the fact that you went to the emergency room for a true medical emergency. Thanks, Cora. Uh, we're gonna move on to, we have a couple questions that are coming through in the chat here. Um, this one's from Delilah, and thank you, Delilah, for joining today. Delilah's question is, if an employee is under control medication, which is prescribed by a doctor, um, do the employers have the right to ask for evidence? So with respect to a worker's compensation claim, uh, you give up some of your HIPAA privacy rights when you file a claim related to that claim. So they may, they may be able to ask for evidence of those conditions. They may be able to dig up past medical records. They don't get carte blanche to get everything, but if it's relevant and related to your, to your worker's compensation claim, then they could ask for uh, that information. Um, they also, you know, just, I'm, I'm trying to limit it to, you know, workers' compensation because there's definitely overlaps with, with other areas of law. Um, but you know, they, you obviously have to be able to do your job, right? So if you're on a controlled substance that prevents you from, uh, you know, operating heavy machinery, then obviously that's relevant to your employment as well. So it, it depends, but in workers' compensation, they, they do have access or more access to your medical records than, than the typical person with the HIPAA privacy rights. Thanks, Richard. And we have another question. This one's from Joshua. And Joshua's question really is he wants to know if his case is a workers' compensation case or maybe a different, you know, wrongful termination case. Joshua was fired because he refused to work in an unsafe work environment and was harassed for his sexuality and for his race. Um, he wants to know, is that a workers' compensation claim or is that a wrongful termination claim? It's not a, it's not a workers' compensation claim because there's no accident, no injury, no incident. Um, it is uh, maybe a hostile work environment, wrongful termination. Uh, it could be constructive termination, which is when an injured employee is not actually terminated, but the conditions of the employment are such that the person can no longer tolerate working there. Um, and you should consult with our employment law department as to the cases involving those types of issues. Thanks, Cora. And just a note on that, we do have a few questions coming in the chat and the Q&A, which are of a similar nature and are more of employment law related. So the advice, Cora's advice and our advice is we have an entire department for employment law for labor and discrimination, and they would be more than happy to take care of you and to take care of your case, but they're not strictly related to workers' compensation. Um, that actually wraps up all the questions that we have for today. 
So I want to thank everybody for joining us today. A huge thank you to Cora and Richard for the time and for their great insight into workers' compensation. Um, a reminder, final reminder for everybody here, there's going to be an additional follow-up webinar next week on Thursday, July 29th at 1 p.m. for more labor and employment law related questions. So whoever posted in the chat questions related to labor and employment, please make sure you can show up to that webinar and all your questions will be answered. Um, if you enjoyed today's webinar, please take a moment, leave a review on our Facebook page. We greatly appreciate it. You can share the word, let everybody know that Morgan & Morgan attorneys are by our side and they're here to help with any workers' compensation or any other legal issues that you might have. Thank you everybody for joining and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks everybody. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.